I gave my wife the dream life. Yet she chose for the tingles, of an AliExpress version of Andrew Tate. So I created the ultimate master plan. And turned it into a nightmare. Welcome, to the best place for your vengeful needs. When a cheating revenge story goes nuclear, it rarely gets as genius as the first story. A cheating wife who seems to have it all, but ends up with nothing. Followed by an investment of 8 pounds, to achieve revenge of epic proportions on a cheating ex. Last story is as personal as it gets. A mean cheater gets told to their face, that he never was a dad. Make sure to smite vengeance on the like button, and chuckle uncontrollably, like the true villain you are. Warning, these revenge stories might be upsetting to some audiences. Also cheaters. Anonymous account to protect my identity, all the names are made up. I'll start with a little background. Me, a 28-year-old male, and my wife who is 26, married three years ago, and been together for six. When we met, I was already in my third year of college. I was studying for a specific job, in the productive and lucrative oil industry. Think of something like the US Army, where you have a job that sends you to different countries. I would go there for some months to work on extra risky tasks, that would pay extra because of it, and then go back and stay home for some months. In the beginning, I was going for six, eight or even ten months, in order to promote as fast as possible. This way, I was able to generate an average income of four years, in my country, in only three months. It's a tough job and I'm working like a crazy person, but I love it. My wife was supportive during this time, and I always knew it's hard for her to live this lifestyle. I always tried to spoil her and compensate for my time spent away from her. I did so by showering her with gifts, and luxurious trips to exotic places. Two years ago, during the virus that hit the world, I tried to come back home after an extended contract. But because the borders got shut down, I had to stay for another two months. When I finally got home, the reunion wasn't what I expected it to be. She told me she couldn't take it anymore. She goes crazy, while being alone at home, and having nothing to do during the time she is waiting. She lost her job, and didn't feel like working again because of it. As I was making good money and wanted to see her happy, I supported her fully. Money wasn't an issue, her happiness was way more important to me. I have to admit, I also felt petrified. The whole situation, made it seem that she wanted to break up. But I was wrong. She didn't. She continued by saying how much she loves me, she wants to give me a baby and take care of it, for me. She sweetly, added. If I have your baby, I can keep a piece of you with me, while you're gone on contracts. We decided to go for it. I was back from a 5 months trip without my woman around. So it wasn't hard for me to keep trying multiple times a day, if you get me. Nonetheless, I became increasingly nervous during the first month of trying. Did this mean we were not able to conceive a child? I remembered how we didn't use protection for over 4 years. I would always pull out, and she never got pregnant. But the insecurity left one morning, when she suddenly wakes me up with a long kiss and smile. She takes out a pregnancy test and shows me the result. I was the happiest man alive. Everything changed. I was a man now, I was a father, I was on top of the world. We would go to every doctor appointment together and enjoy every moment of it. When I would be on a project abroad, I would keep up to date by receiving and talking pictures and echo sounds. There were no complications with the pregnancy. The labor was even better. Everything went as planned and it was amazing. We, as a family, were in cloud nine. One month later, I went on another contract to make some money, that would cover every need for our little baby. Halfway during this contract, I suddenly receive a text from my wife. A short and simple text of four words, that send me into a dark and deep depression. I, want a divorce. She, wants a divorce? I didn't understand. We're a loving family that's doing great, and I'm going through fire and water to make sure. I tried calling her instantly to find out what's wrong, or worse, did something bad happen? But she didn't pick up or answer any texts after dropping this bomb on me. I couldn't get my mind away from the situation at home. I made a request to my company, to send me back as an emergency. But it would take some days. It got approved, and while I was preparing my suitcase, I receive a pulse of her on my phone. We would talk a few days and she would dance around the topic, before dropping an explanation for her text. I want a divorce. So I can marry, the love of my life. 
the love of your life? Who, is this woman? All I knew for sure, is that I should go home ASAP. I'm back in my homeland and rush home. When I get there, silence. This is where it sunk in. Nobody is home. The baby was gone, she was nowhere to be found. Two weeks later, I was in court to settle the divorce. During this, I found out that she had a lover, for well over four years. This, love of her life, had been there all this time. She plans to marry him as soon as the divorce is over with. The laws in my country are different, so I won't go into detail. But I knew that my first priority, should be to invest in a skilled lawyer. My wife went the other way. She didn't seem to care as much by getting a cheaper one. She represents herself by mostly speaking, without the assistance of her lawyer. Her story goes mostly as follows. It's true, I'm guilty of love, and I'm a woman. This man is never home. He is, never there. In my country, the law usually favors women. But cheating is considered to be a break of contract. Due to us being married, she was the one at fault. She asks the judge for full custody of the child, in order for me to pay child support. I'm saying it this way, deliberately. And I was not going to let that happen. After consulting with my lawyer and an accountant, it seems that I only had to pay child support, from my base salary. My bonuses won't be included, since in the eyes of the law, those earnings are related to me risking my life. So the fruits are therefore mine alone. Besides, the company pays way less taxes on bonuses that are related to dangerous tasks. So my base salary, was around 10% of my income. When she found out, that she would receive next to nothing worth fighting for, I gave her the option of taking full custody, of the child, with a no contact rule. On top of that, I would never ask her for child support. She agreed in a second. It didn't even take her any struggle. As a mother, she gave up any claim to the child. Basically agreeing to get out of our lives. Therefore, we were able to change the birth certificate of the child, to me as the father, and a blank space for the mother. During the trial, her lover was asked to come as a witness. And the doofus agreed. He is an Ali Express version of Andrew Tate. He clearly tries to be like him, an actual alpha man. But all I could see, was him treating her crappy, and it seems to turn her on. He has a pretty good income, as he has a small company which seems to do okay. Less than half my salary, but it still is a lot for our country, and here's the kicker. He's always home. During the trial, he confessed to cheating behind my back for three straight years. He laid claim on the baby, saying it was really his. He is sure of this, because he knows that she tricked me into wanting a child and believing it's mine, so I wouldn't be able to find out about her cheating. He acknowledged that he knew of the marriage, and that he was aware of ruining the marriage, yet he decided to go through with it. He basically confessed to alienating the love in our lawful relationship, which is punishable by law. Or something like that, my lawyer explained to me. The only reason for him to say this, was to attack me and make me feel horrible. As it did nothing for their case, but make it worse. Now at this point, the child situation was already done, and an agreement was signed. But it wasn't over yet. The judge asked my wife directly if she knew the child was her lover's. She was adamant about it, and ordered a DNA test to confirm. We came to the conclusion that the agreement wouldn't be final yet, and wait for the DNA test results. If the child was theirs, I could cancel the agreement and, settle the situation another way, as the child wouldn't be biologically mine. When the results came in, we went back into court to discuss the terms of the agreement. The judge would go over the DNA results. The child, was biologically theirs. The test confirmed what they said. The judge said that she would allow me to cancel the agreement, and settle the situation with my wife in another way. Solely on the reason, that the child wasn't biologically mine. I said, no your honor. This child is mine. And I want to keep him. The judge was stunned for a minute, but then she said, If the agreement is a valid contract, and since you don't want to void it, then, sir, you are the father and no one can take that child away from you. In my country, it doesn't matter who the biological parent is, but it does matter who the parent is in the documents. And since he knew he is the father since the beginning, and did not come to the hospital to declare it, he automatically cancelled all his paternal claims. Sounds stupid, 
but it makes sense is in order to protect the idea of a family and if a man recognize a fatherless child at the hospital. He should not fear that the biological father will come back, in order to protect the value and integrity of the family. Now the divorce was over, I got my baby, and my cheating wife was out of my life. First thing I did, was hire three babysitters to work eight hours a day, so my child has someone to stay with him 24-7. So I can go back to work? No of course not, so I have time to prepare. For my revenge. I started two separate companies, with the help of an online assistant from India. You can hire them at a low cost and they do whatever you need online. This guy made two professional companies. One in industrial credits, which is a company that lends money to businesses, for a lower rate than banks. The second one, was a like the lovers company, but this one was in the same city as his. Both were made just for, one client, my ex-wife's lover. My assistant started sending tons of ads from my credit company to him. Emails targeted Google and Facebook ads etc. I was sure that he knows that if he needs money, this is the place he can lend a lot with low rates. Next, I made a lot of advertisements on the second company. But this company only had the relevant machinery, the rented space, and only one worker, the cleaning lady. Every time someone would call for the company services, they got the automatic decline message, because we're simply overbooked. I could see the phone numbers, and my ex's lover, was one of them. Multiple times actually, and he goes mad every time he got rejected. I imagine it's because he's confronted with how big the competition is. Now it was the time, to give him the bait. Because my company had some, problems in the main country, I don't even remember in which country this company was registered. They changed the management and wanted to liquidate some company assets. So the regional manager wanted to sell some of the equipment. When he heard this, he started calling and sending emails to buy them out. The response was something like, we are an international company, so we can't sell the brand, but we can sell some equipment. It would be illegal for me to sell the company without showing him the accountant's data, which was empty. But it's legal to sell the equipment, which can be sold with a simple contract. He wanted the competition out of his city, he didn't need the equipment. So the manager gave him a deal. If you buy our equipment for let's say, three times the price, we can say in the contract that we'll stop business activities in this city. In just two hours, I received calls and emails on my first company, for credit for that equipment such and such. I knew he was out of money, because he spent a lot on his future wedding with my ex-wife. I've sent him the contract. Based on our credit evaluation, the equipment is not worth that amount of money, so he will need to give us a guarantee, his company. He is not allowed to sell any equipment or parts of his company, until he pays everything back and if he is behind in payment for 6 months straight, I get all of it. Also, in the contract I stated that the credit company will buy that equipment directly, basically, I just give myself my money. And I made sure every single word of the contract is legal, and is a deal good enough for him to take it. Later that same day, he sent me the signed contract. Now normally, he should be able to pay for everything, even if the clients he hoped he will get from this company are non-existent. He still should be able to pay if he gives me around 80% of his company income. For the next 5 years. Fast forward a bit. On the day of their wedding, I went to give them an envelope during the reception. In our country, it's tradition to give money in envelopes as a wedding gift, to help the newlywed couple. When he saw me, with envelope in hand, he wasn't mad at all. He starts to laugh at me, telling me to get out, because I was not invited and they surely don't need my money. I smiled back, and told him to open the envelope. He took the envelope and looked inside, then straight into my eyes. He laughs again, and asks what it is. I told him with a big Hollywood smile. I'll see you in court next week, enjoy your wedding night. Now, you must be bubbly curious to what was in the envelope. I won't leave you in anticipation for long. I'm suing him, for child support. As I said before, in my country, if you are aware that you have a child and refuse to go to the hospital to recognize him, you are no longer the father, but you are still forced to pay child support. And it gets even better. Because when you tried to dodge the responsibility knowingly, it's lawfully perceived to be as bad as running away from a car accident scene. So the child support payments are at an increased rate. He didn't want to pay anything during the first custody trial. So he put up a dramatic struggle, pretending he wanted the child or co-custody, because he's the biological father. At that point, I knew I would take the responsibility of my child. But while surprising them with the decision of keeping the child as mine was great. Dragging the trial and draining him of money was a big bonus. Dragging on the trial, 
created the opportunity of getting DNA evidence of him being the biological father, and his self-damning declarations. So during the trial for the child support, all the judge needed was to look at the declarations of the first trial. The judge ended the trial with a swift, yet painful decision. She demanded him to pay 40% of his income, including his company income, for the duration since the child was born, until he will finish college or I get married. Guess who didn't manage to pay? And guess who is the new owner, of his company? Now I don't work anymore, I just run his former company and spend almost all my time with my child. I'll answer some questions many people had. A lot of people ask me about the child, and the fact that I'm not the biological father. I do not plan to hide from my child that I'm not the biological father. We will talk about this, when the time comes. Most probably during high school, or around that age. Until then, I will try to be the best friend and paternal figure I can be. I don't have any objection if my child decides to go to the biological father. I got a comment about deceiving the child into bonding. I need this child more than you think. After all that happened, I don't want to be in a relationship at this time. I'm lonely and being financially free, gave me no other purpose in life, than taking care of my child. The consequences were for my cheating ex-wife, who committed paternity fraud and the douchebag who knowingly participated. They were punished, not the innocent child. I'm not one for the drama, but I am still in touch with him. If he's one day late on child support, I have my lawyer on retainer. If you think I don't have the best intentions at heart for my child, I couldn't care less. I take care of myself and my child. If you are the one who can't handle that, maybe you're the problem. When I was at university, I started dating this guy. At first, he was wonderful. Dedicated to his studies, fun to be around, attentive, and always surprising me with things, working hard at his job etc. Then, bit by bit, things unraveled. He started skipping classes. Then he barely bothered to go at all. Worse still, he never helped around the house. Never washed up, cleaned up, did laundry. Nothing. He was even fired from his job, for too many no-shows. All he wanted to do was sit at home and play Xbox, or browse the message boards and forums, this was in the days before social media, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. This left me having to pick up extra shifts, sometimes double and triple shifts. All while going to class and studying. I later learned that this was a pattern for him. He'd be really dedicated to whatever he set his heart on, but then get bored, and fall back into old bad habits. Then he'd find a new passion, and rinse and repeat. I knew I should have ended the relationship much sooner, but I held out hope that he would snap out of it, that maybe it was just exam stress getting to him. I desperately wanted things to go back to how they were. But it was not meant to be. It became worse when I caught him cheating, and threw him out. I was so stressed with everything that it wasn't until the next day, that our joint savings account crossed my mind. There was a little over 5,000 pounds in there, and bar a few hundred from him, the rest was money I had saved. I checked the account, and it was all gone. My ex had cleaned out the account and moved into a new flat with his side chick. I called the bank straight away. There was nothing they could do. He was authorized on the account. I contacted the police, they told me there was nothing they could do since it was a joint account, so nothing criminal had happened. They suggested taking it to civil court, but said I'd probably spend more money than I got back in legal fees, so it likely, wasn't worth it. My ex had stolen 5,000 pounds, and there was nothing I could do about it. I felt like such an idiot. I got even angrier when I saw his posts on various forums, boasting about his new game consoles, new games, new TVs and gadgets. All bought with my money. I'm not usually a vengeful person. Petty on occasion, sure, but I've never wanted to exact revenge as much as I did right then. And I knew just how to do it. While I was a student, I tempt every summer to help pay for my studies. One such job had been for a debt collection agency. The work was as shitty as you can imagine, but it paid really well, and it was only for a few months. My ex had been dodging debt for many years, and he was very proud of that fact. He was also proud of the fact that his debt was close to being statute barred, and he hadn't paid a penny. For those of you who don't know, in the UK, creditors have about six years to collect a debt, and then it becomes statute barred. That means the money is still owed, but creditors have no legal way to enforce payment, such as using bailiffs. My ex was a few months away from reaching statute barred status. However, what a lot of people don't know is that making a payment on that debt, resets the clock. 
If you pay any amount, then that six years starts from scratch. Previously, I had used my insider knowledge to help him dodge the debt. Now, I would use it to hit him, where it hurt. By the end of our relationship, I was handling everything, including his debts. I had the paperwork, so I knew who he owed and how much. I called his creditors up. I was honest and said I was a friend calling to make a payment on his behalf. I didn't pretend to be him because that would be a big legal no-no. They weren't allowed to disclose any details, but they were able to take payment. I paid the minimum I could on each debt, about one pound on most, but one had a minimum payment of one pound and fifty pence. It was the best eight pounds and fifty pence I have ever spent. I also made sure to give them his new address and contact details, as well as his parents' address. Having worked in the biz, I knew they wouldn't change the address since I wasn't the account holder, but they would note it. They had various systems where they could search for his name against that address and see if anything came up. If they got a hit, they'd change the address. The trap was set. All I had to do was wait. A few months rolled by. Then it happened. His posts on the forums went from boasting about his new gaming PC, to panic about a court date. He called me and begged for advice. I told him to buzz her off. Seeing I wouldn't help, he asked for advice in the forums. One of his online friends told him not to turn up to court, that way they wouldn't be able to prosecute without him there. It was terrible advice that was 100% untrue. In fact, not showing up is one of the worst things you can do, especially in civil court. This was getting better and better. The court date came and went. My ex, naturally, didn't go. A few weeks later, my ex posted photos of his empty flat. Bailiffs had cleaned him out and taken every last one of his shiny new gadgets and toys. On top of that, he ended up with several CCJs, county court judgments. These are a big deal and can seriously damage your credit history, making it hard to get bank accounts outside of basic ones, near impossible to get credit, including getting a mortgage. And it can also make it hard to rent a place since many landlords don't like renting to people with CCJs, as they're considered high risk. He also won't be able to find jobs in the financial sector. Now that he was broke and didn't have nice things, his side chick left him. I never got my £5,000 back, but it felt good to see everything he bought with his ill-gotten gains taken away. Hope that £5,000 was worth it. For anyone wondering how a student accrued six years of debt, he started at the university I attended when he was 25. He had initially gone to a different university at 18, but dropped out at 19 and went into the world of work. Then he convinced his parents to fund a business degree. He wanted to become an entrepreneur. And for anyone worried about the age gap, I deferred my university start date by a few years so I could travel. I was 22 when we started dating. He was 26. Oh man, as a former debt collection agent, this was absolutely genius. Spot on, also extra points that might have messed up his business degree. I mean, assuming he ever completed it. Many high managerial positions mean taking credit checks and CGs discount you a lot of the time and he's definitely discounted from working in finance. Also, maybe you spoke to me. I did get a call from a woman who did just this. She called and advised she was calling to make a payment because her ex, the account holder, had cheated. I was just training at the time, and I thought, okay, weird. But then I spoke to my supervisor about it, and he burst out laughing and told me what she had done, reset his statue barred counter. Probably not me as I kept it as neutral as possible and definitely didn't mention he had cheated. I was just like, yeah, I'm calling to pay on behalf of, account holder, and I was very careful not to say he asked me to or anything, in case and led to legal issues. I didn't want to give him anything he could use to wriggle out of it. But that's wild, that somebody else did that too. Awesome. You learned a lesson too. No joint account unless married. It is too easy to cut and run otherwise and nothing can be done. This won't stop an account from being cleaned out but can be brought up in divorce proceedings. Yes, it was a very hard but important lesson. I just wish it hadn't cost me £5,000. It was my own stupid fault. I took that lesson to heart. I live near a military base in the US, and I've heard horror stories of young Marines giving their girlfriends access to their accounts, or even signing a power of attorney for them, go overseas on deployment, and then come home to find an empty apartment slash house, accounts emptied, etc. There are some truly heartless people out there man. Yup, there are some real leeches out there. So sad that so many get taken advantage of. 
I clicked this wondering how far our revenge can go with just 8 pounds and 50 pence, and this totally delivers. Also, I cannot believe he had the gall to ask you for help after he stole thousands from you. After reading so many posts where the OP folds after being treated like garbage by their family or significant other, your response is gold. Love this story. An ex of mine did something similar and left me with $5,000 in credit card debt. This was over 15 years ago. I was young and stupid and had given him the secondary card on my account. I'd bought him a really nice bicycle while we were together, after the breakup he hadn't collected it from my place yet. I gave it away. He threatened to call the cops on me for stealing his bike but the purchase was on my credit card, and the receipt was in my name. So he couldn't do crap. It was petty as hell, and certainly didn't help me pay off the credit card debt, but damn it felt good. I love it. Petty, but perfect. Back in the mid-90s, my sister got knocked up by a guy. She was 17, he was 18. I despised the guy with pretty much every fiber of my being. He gave off a really scummy vibe. Part of it could also be tribal, I was the alpha male and he was intruding on my territory sort of thing. I didn't want him there, told him as much, and then he plopped his ass down and proceeded to leech off my mom and annoy the crap out of me, with his mere presence. My mom decided, however, that a baby should know their father. So she invited him to come live in our house without telling me. Took me a week to calm down enough so that when I eventually came back, I didn't punch him when I walked in the door. John was a piece of shit, great artistic talent, but all he did all day was sit out in the garage and do prison tats for people. In addition to stealing mine and my deceased father's power tools and pawning them for a few bucks, so he could get some cigarettes. I worked a full-time job and went to school, so I would be gone 12 to 14 hours a day but it felt like I was pulling into the driveway of a frat house. With a dozen or so people drinking and partying in the garage, until I had to leave in the morning. I slowly curtailed those shenanigans, by being a giant pain in the ass to all the guests by having their cars towed or their wheels inexplicably sticked. By the time my nephew was two, I'd managed to put a stop to the 24-hour party zone, but people would still congregate on Saturdays. A few months later I'd had enough, and threw John to the curb. My sister's friends all came forward to tell her about how he'd hit on all of them and probably slept with half of them. Not only those, plus some other women he'd meet, all the while professing his devotion to my sister and their child. After I'd thrown him out, John disappeared for eight years. Eight whole years. No idea where, and I really didn't care. Then came a court summons for a custody hearing. John was suing for, custody. However, in the eight years since he'd disappeared, my sister had met a guy and they'd gotten married. His name is Jimmy, and he's a stand-up guy. My nephew was formally adopted by Jimmy and changed his legal name. The first hearing was dismissed, because the allegations made as the basis for the custody hearing were investigated by CPS, and decided as having no substance in fact. Nephew wasn't living in poor conditions, mistreated, or neglected. House wasn't a disaster and in danger of falling apart, nor was it a health threat. Every few months, John would file another custody hearing request until it finally got a date. John made a number of allegations, all of which were disproven by documentation and facts. Finally, the judge decided he'd had enough and called my 10-year-old nephew up, and asked him who he wanted to live with. I don't know him. He walked out of my life when I was two. He's not my dad, Jimmy is my dad, and that other man will never be my dad. And I don't ever want to see him again. The judge ruled against John and dismissed his custody request with prejudice. When I looked at John, he was sobbing in his chair as his mother comforted him. I sneered at him and flipped him off, as I walked out of the courtroom. As to why John was missing for eight years? Apparently, he'd been committed to a mental facility in Tennessee, and when he got out years later, he went on SSI disability. Then he plotted various ways to hurt me, my sister, and my mom once he got out. He'd called CPS on us, made a number of anonymous complaints about narcotics and firearms, and even called the fire department a time or two. The custody hearing was meant to be the culminating event. But fortunately, John was an idiot, and we had enough money to hire a good attorney. A few years later, John tried to mend some fences with my nephew and invited him to come down to where he lived and meet his relatives, including a half-brother my nephew didn't even know he had. My nephew also has a half-sister, but her mother deliberately excluded John from the birth certificate. 
This is in addition to the half brother and sister he has from his mom and adoptive father. Needless to say, my nephew was not terribly impressed by his relatives. Now I gotta admit, my nephew and brother in law are some serious rednecks, and they both love guns, hunting, camping out, and generally living the redneck lifestyle. But apparently, John and his family took it to some serious extremes. There's a photo I saw one time on the internet with some guy sitting on a toilet on his front porch, and I imagine John and his extended family live something like that, only seriously, and not done as an internet joke. Considering the area, I would not be surprised. When my nephew was 15, almost 16, we received a call that John passed away. Someone had put a piece to the back of his coconut, and picked his noodles out, as he sat on the couch in his mobile home. I felt sorry for John's girlfriend and her son, who found him, but for John, I didn't feel a thing. A journalist tracked my nephew down a few months later and filled us in on some details. Apparently, John passed as the result of a homicide for hire plot. We learned through our own sources that John had been dealing narcotics and unknowingly moved into someone else's territory. Typical redneck retribution I guess. The journalist asked my nephew for a quote. Sure. I wish I could meet the man who did it. The journalist asked curiously, why is that? So I could shake his hand. John was never my dad, and I won't miss him. Based on the story, it just sounded like they were hanging out with a friend. I can understand having them towed, as they had to break some parking law or stuff to have it happen. But what you did seems a bit mutt. I know it's not the same level, but I'm trying to make a point that based on what you wrote. They were just hanging out with a friend. I was a delivery driver for Lowe's at the time, and on Saturdays during the summer I would regularly put in 11-hour days. I had no problem with a couple people coming over, but when there are 12 cars and 20-some people, it's a bit much. I only had one rule, don't park in the driveway. And if you do park in the driveway and I get home and honk my horn, move your car now. Instead, I was cussed out and told off. I could legally have them towed whenever I wanted. Hell. I did it on Christmas Eve one year when our neighbor across the street had a party, and all their friends parked in my yard, despite asking them not to and to move the ones that were parked there. I was sitting in a lawn chair with my coat on, a blanket over my lap, and a thermos of hot chocolate in hand waiting for the fun. They did not disappoint. It wasn't an issue next year or any year after. When I was younger, I freely admit to being a grade A prick, and I wouldn't have had any regret going after someone. I was big, mean, and barely able to contain a violent temper. I'm a lot calmer these days, but I could have easily gone down a different path. You stayed till the end, which means you're the one I make these episodes for. Thank you for your support, I really appreciate you. Subscribe, so you don't miss out on future episodes and show your vengeful devotion, by tickling the like button without mercy. Do you have any experiences surrounding the topic of this episode? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. I'll be seeing you, in the next one. Remember that these stories are shared for your entertainment. This content is to be taken as such, and nothing else. Royal AI, rejects advocation or instigation of illegal actions.